soon as I walked in the paddock, I went, oh yeah, I remember this place well now. And there's a lot of guys in the Jonction that I met back then that I remembered and they remembered me. It was good to talk about old times. Andy, how did you play today? I think I shot a 92. But the first four holes, I started off with 46. Double bogey, double bogey. People don't realize that, but it's, it's like a little family in there. I know when you get on the racetrack, it's kind of every man for himself. It's dangerous out there, so you try and protect one another. But once you get back to the jocks room, you know, it's we had a lot of fun in there, played a lot of pranks on one another, and it was like a happy family. Now, that's one of the things I miss about riding. Well, anytime you can help anybody that's uh, got cancer, the same as myself. I, I know when I had the cancer, I didn't know anybody that had it, and I was very scared. I never knew anybody that survived, and I thought my life was over. I, I, thought, uh, I thought I was toast. I uh, went to uh, the uh, oncologist, he started me off on some vaccine shots, which I think changed my diet also. I'm vegetarian now, and I, between, I think between changing my diet and the oncologist with his vaccine shots, I think has helped save my life. But, uh, you know, it's, it's very scary when you're going through something like that by yourself. And I realize that, and anytime anybody calls me or, or wants uh, any information on cancer or any help I can give, you know, I'm, I'm right there 100% to give it because I know when I was going through it myself, I'd like to have had somebody that went through the same thing as me. In 1996, we did something that had never been done before. We took our cameras to the Stewart's office here at Hastings Racecourse. We met with them, that would be the Stewart's, and three jockeys as they watched and reviewed a possible racing in practice. This was cool. I was kind of told to take back off of the speed, and uh, <clears throat> so when Sam, or when Jake broke strong like that, uh, I was hoping that he had enough horse to kind of just clear me. And as it was, he just didn't quite clear me. And as much as uh, Davey was shouting and screaming for help, I couldn't really give him much of a shot because it was uh, uh, it was getting a little tight in there for him. I actually thought I had him had him cleared when I started to drop over. That's that when all the screaming started. You can you can see me look back and and you know I just didn't realize that there was a guy still in on the fence. In your blind spot there? Yeah, you know he was right. He was kind of on the flank of a uh, of Danny here. And then you can see Davey start to take and hold here. You could see what was going to happen, but I couldn't really see him. And I actually thought I had Danny clear when I started to drop over. I, you can see now on the films that I didn't. But well, you have lots of lots of horse away from the gate, Jake. Yeah, I kind of took a hold of took a hold of her a little too much to try to slow down the pace before I actually got my position. Well, I think he should have, uh, without question, uh, given the boys on the inside a little bit more room. He had all the horse. Just to go right on by there. He'd have kept riding. If he'd have kept riding, he'd have been all right. right. He, he, he chose to slow, slow it down too early. The thing about keeping riding, I mean, he can set the pace he wants to set, but he's still responsible to leave room for the fellas that are inside. I mean, if if he if he if he only had the one inside of him, he could have slowed it down that much. He didn't even know Dave was there, and uh, that's just. That's just not enough. That's not enough effort on his part. He's got to know where the other guys are. Well, he had one guy on the inside of him, regardless of where Dave is. is he uh, come down far more than he should have should have come down. He looked back. He could see uh, Danny on the inside of him. He didn't even give Danny a break. Uh, he had lots of horse. The horse isn't lugging in on him or anything. He could have just rolled right on by. So I can't uh, I can't really help him on this. I I think he. Uh, should um, no, maybe great. take the maybe take the three days. Congratulations to the Sport of Kings for 16 years of, of service to the horse racing world. Don't go away. The Sport of Kings will be right back. Three hundred shows. That's good in the TV business any day, and in the horse business, you're with us all the time. Let's do 300 more. In 2001, we won our second Sovereign Award with a piece on Spud O'Connor, who after learning how to cope with his demons, went on to become a successful trainer at Hastings. Actually, Spud was so candid with the piece, we probably should have gave him half the Sovereign It hasn't been easy. You know, there's been times where I've, I've wanted to throw my arms in the air, and, uh, but I think, uh, the, the people in the Winners Foundation, like Ralph Therese and Brian McAfee and, and Bill Turner, and, uh, 
there's good support network here, which helps, you know. And there's a, at least a dozen or so guys that are sober on the backside today because of the Winners Foundation. My mom and my brother have really stood by me, you know. Well, he's, and, he's uh, Dad did a lot for Racing BC. He's in the Hall of Fame here. You know what he used to say to me? Brian, you worry about things you can't do nothing about. And I have a tendency to worry about things I can't, I can't control. He says, just do your job and, and do the groundwork and, and things will turn out if they're supposed to, you know. That was one of his favorite sayings, there ain't no hell for a high stepper. It was a pretty emotional couple of weeks, like the horse win on Father's Day, and three days later I got my five-year chip for being sober. And two weeks later he win, uh, win again in an optional allowance. And I wanted to run it one more time and, because we were getting kind of slow in the dough. And, <laughs> And, and Dad always says, if you're running a horse because you're broke, you probably shouldn't. So I sent him home. In 1993, our second year of doing the Sport of Kings, we had the opportunity to visit with Hall of Fame jockey and trainer Johnny Longden. And what Longden brought to the table was he enjoyed seeing his close old friends that he hadn't seen in a while. Plus, man, did John love talking to the people. John, how have riders changed in the last since you've been riding? Any special way? No, I, not exactly. The, we we get a, a, a more of a, a riders from other countries over here now. I don't know why we don't develop riders, uh, American or Canadian riders, like we used to. God, that's what the cane. <laughs> you never been that light in your life, John. No, I couldn't do that before. I know. That's a good outfit, John. How are you? Good, how are you? Fine. Good to see you. Hi. Oh, yeah. How are you? How are you doing? Good. 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 Good protection. Do you really enjoy going into the jocks and visiting your old, your old friends, it looks like? <laughs> I do, I do. We had a great reunion yesterday at Hollywood Park. All the old writers, they invited them there, and we had a great time. And I like to see them all. Shoemaker was there, and, and it was a great day yesterday. And it's a great pleasure for me to come here uh, with Jack Diamond, you know. He's a good friend, and he's done so much for racing. And it's a pleasure that I can come up here. The Bay Circuit in the interior has always drawn a keen interest for those of us working with the sport of kings. And it was for this reason we took our cameras up to the interior to give you a first-hand look at what goes on with this unique form of horse racing. To do this, we asked former Hastings Park jockey Ron Billadu, and he gave us what we would call a royal tour. Uh, but this is uh, what I'll drive to work today. I kind of like to think I can win on every horse I ride, Tom. You know, I mean, if I didn't think that, um, I shouldn't be on it. I don't think there's anything guaranteed in this business, and anybody that does is a fool because uh, so many things can happen during a course of a race. It gets pretty hot in the jocks room. Some of the, you know, in this heat, the riders, we sometimes have to blow a little steam off, you know, because of the heat, and you kind of later on in the day you you know you make up you know sorry for whatever hap for whatever reason but it, it does kind of bother you when it's this hot you do get your tempers get a little short i i like to ride horses i don't want to go sit in a bench it's like going to a baseball game you know you don't go play baseball and sit in the bench you like to go and play on our last segment for today, we're taking it back to the year 1992 for our first segment. This is where we took our cameras to the starting gate. We did something that was never done before, we believe, on television. We actually went into the starting gate, and this is what we all watched back in 1992. When it comes to danger on the racetrack, jockeys have probably the highest rate of danger here. But the people that are underrated and misunderstood quite often are the assistant starters. So what we're going to do is take you into the starting gate, let you know what goes through two jocks' minds. One of them is Danny Brock. I'll introduce you to Danny to my left. 
This is Cowboy. He's from the Frank Barry barn. Naturally, he's not a thoroughbred. He's a pony. We've used him before in doing a scene like this, and he's perfect for what we want to show you, the audience. And, all right, Cowboy, let's take this pick out of our pocket. Okay. Now, as you can see, Joe's got a hole in it. Sure, my horse doesn't act up in it. But the main thing is, we want to make sure that we have our helmet. This is something we don't do. We make sure the helmet strap is hooked up for safety reasons. So we always tell the jock when they leave the paddock, make sure your strap is on. Next thing you do is make sure your goggles are down. Because if they're not down, then you're in trouble. Now, Joe has got me. He's looking over to make sure Danny's all right. And sometimes what will happen is these horses will get to play. And Joe, what happens when they do get to play? That, like he'll want to bite your horse. Or... I just got just keep his head pushed over so he can't they can't get to fight with each other, biting or grabbing or it's, you know a lot of they do a lot of that biting and grabbing thing. They like that. Main principle is we want to make sure that they're alert and that they are going to break straight. And this is a big part of the assistant starter and the jock. So my job is shift a bit, and we're ready to roll. So boom, we're gone. Well, that's it for this special edition of the Sport of Kings, where we celebrated 16 seasons, 300 shows of being your eyes and ears to the world of horse racing, right here in British Columbia. A couple of things to leave you with, this all could have made possible. This all was made possible thanks to our sponsors, horsemen, and most of all, you out there. Remember, keep it straight, or we are going to get you on that final turn.